And also, it's just that we can call in this case, people can see in the image. Yeah. 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 So if Sorry, you start to feel the projector on your shoulder, then move to the, that way. But yeah, that's it. Oh. Sorry, just one second. Okay. Uh, yeah, I could just start talking. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm I'm Nick. I'm from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. We have a kind of pretty small research group uh, in the School of Civil Engineering. And um, we kind of work across the Southeast Queensland region and a bit of the Solomon Islands where, you know, um, Solomon Islands particularly, we have basically no gauging data. And, um, in Southeast Queensland, we've got these um, issues uh, where we're basically interested in what's working out what's going into our receiving water environments and also these processes of erosion that are happening. Um, so it's really, uh, if you advance the slide, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I should probably put that slide after the next few, but yeah, that's fine. Um, so it's really led us to this computer vision stream gauging um development process uh where we want to be able to deploy um a kind of optical method of measuring um flow um kind of rapidly and kind of collect more data which we're always interested in collecting um and so as part of that kind of automated <laughs> process um you got to think about uh, how do we infer the quality of that data that's coming out of an automatic process that you're not manually looking at yourself. Um, so the next slide will get you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so you know Nick just gave a really good summary of why you know you want to go towards an optical approach. Um, like the benefits that you can see there. Uh, you've you know reduced environmental impact. Um, Kind of, you don't have to touch the thing that you're measuring. You can get really good visualization of what's what's happening. Um, you see the water color and the bank condition, which is really important for us. Um, safety is becoming more and more of an issue. And um, kind of look at the uncertainty in existing rating squares, which have kind of poor um, kind of data resolution and in space and time. Um, and then yeah, the flexibility and the cost for the next slide would be good. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, the, I guess we're building on the giant, uh, the shoulders of giants here. Um, there's a lot of research that's uh, gone into this kind of optical methods of measuring flow in the past um, and kind of looking towards improving some of the existing challenges um, there. Um, so basically what it is, just to uh, give them you an idea of what it is. It's uh, a little box with two kind of train brake batteries and uh, a stack of a modem, a uh, PCB that controls everything, and a uh, NVIDIA Jetson sitting on top to do kind of GPU processing one day. Um, and then it's got a stereo camera with a 12 centimeter baseline between the cameras and a sliding lens mechanism um, for day and night modes. On top, so you can put that up on a on a pole on a tripod, um, put it to the secure it to a, a side of bridge railing or something. Um, that's just an IR uh, light blaster and a solar panel. You can advance that for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then start collecting some videos and kind of analyze the motion of those video videos um, using optical flow and stacking those. Across, and that's kind of the visualization of that, um, the motion that's seen. So, from there, using the stereo cameras, if you advance the slide, um, we're able to survey the scene in front of us and see kind of the, the ground and also the vegetation over the ground um, and work out where the water level is likely to be. Um, and so, once you know where the water level is likely to be, and the camera has an INU in it, it knows where, what its angle is, what's going on with it, with its orientation. It can project out where that plane is um, by feeling where gravity is, and it just assumes that that water plane is um, kind of in line with gravity. Um, and so you set 
where your boundaries are upstream and downstream for your analysis. And um, if you advance the slide, uh, you can start computing uh, discharge once you put in a cross section, of course. Um, so yeah, so up to that stage, before you put in a cross section, you can have kind of surface velocities um, automatically rectified into meters per second um, from the optical motion. So another slide advancement. Um, from there, we're measuring um, the water level, different water levels of the site in one centimeter increments over time, and measuring those kind of patchy um, water um, water surface motions and kind of building up that um, surface profile distribution in across the cross section and over the water level range. So the next slide. Um, so yeah, the stereo camera allows us to survey kind of the scene in front of it out to about 40 meters as you see there. Um, and, uh, but the, the one, yeah, one aspect that gives, gives us a bit of grief um, is measuring that cross section um, kind of in the water. So we'd like to be able to do that a little bit more easily. So if you advance a slide, yeah, we are, we're tinkering with some ideas around that. Um, so there's kind of two ways that you'd normally do a, a cross section, I guess, kind of if you can manually with a star um, going across the stream, if you can get in there, um, or using a, like an ADCP style boat. Um, and so we've got basically the, the all the clever bits of a, a the drone that keeps its position in space um, and like an ultrasonic sensor or a sonar on the boat um, to automatically tie that camera in to, to see what it's surveying at the time and bring that information underneath the surface of the water that we can't see out to where it can can um, interpret that like what's underneath where it can't see. Uh, yeah, so that's the basic idea of it. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, I'll just explain a bit about um, how this all comes together. So this is a, a quite topical river in Australia, um, quite important one, the Murray River. Um, and so if you look at the motions in this video, um, it would be pretty hard for us to just guess what the flow is. Um, so the, the level gauging station there, the government one is estimating 254 meters cubed per second. If you advance the slide, um, yeah, we can visualize the optical flow motions um, across that video. You can see there's all types of motions rather than, uh, other than just the, the stream, the, the motions on the surface itself. So if you advance the slide, we, we um, once we get that, water level plane, we filter out the motions that are um, kind of not on that, that plane of, of the water surface. So you get rid of the swinging rope in front, which wasn't intentional to have that rope in front of the camera, um, but it was a good challenge. And, um, and kind of all this uh, other kind of capillary waves. Uh, so, so this is the raw optical signal of the, the flow. Um, so if you just took that on face value um, with the cross section, to advance the slide, you get a raw measurement of 152 meters cubed per second, which isn't quite there. Um, so if you advance the slide, um, if we look at where we're, we're measuring each of these at 10 centimeter increments across the stream um, and relate that to where we are relative to the cross section when we're measuring that, that surface, kind of the how far you're away from the bottom and the edge, um, if you advance the slide, uh, and another time, you can plot that kind of surface velocity instead of uh, as across the distance, you can um, plot it in a different kind of uh, transformed space uh, where you have the kind of uh, relationship with how far away your surface velocity is from your cross section at that point in time. So if you advance the slide there, um, you should see, well, we can, we can easily see now where we're kind of getting poor visibility of the flow motion in that in that region potentially if if um, the if this relationship was to hold um, if you advance the slide we can also see where we've got a limit of our optical flow resolution kind of falls off it's too far away from the camera um, so if you advance the slide from there 
um, we can pick out the, the strongest parts of that signal and advance the slide and then fit this kind of profile model across that relationship there and then put it back into the, the kind of cross-section space and you get this nice kind of gap filled um, kind of yeah, model of kind of fitted to your best observations of what's going on. And so these best observations, you're kind of like filling in your learning distribution and you you might get this area in the next measurement or a few days from now, you might see this, this part and then you'll be able to fit to that part as well. Um, and so from there, yeah, that's just a two parameter model. Um, you can read about it in the paper I've submitted to Hess. Um, so yeah, the measurement gets a bit bit closer to the station rating there at 245 minutes two percent. Um, so hopefully that explains that a bit. If you can advance it. Um, yeah, so the the first parameter there is kind of the the maximum free surface velocity that uh, it approaches. Um, and the second parameter, if you advance the slide, um, I'm not really sure about, uh, but if you advance the slide, it probably has something to do with the relationship with the channel geometry and the roughness. Um, so if you advance the slide from there. So when you've got this automated system, then it's just doing the, um, analyzing the videos and working out what's going on. We, since we're in Australia, the Bureau, Bureau of Meteorology there has kind of stream flow data quality standards. Um, and all the agencies in Australia actually you know, they use their own classifications. They can range from 15 different classifications all the way up to like 60 different quality codes, um, depending on the agency. But the Bureau of Meteorology tries to standardize each of that and each one kind of falls into one of these categories. Um, so if you advance the slide, yeah, the bottom one there is if you have bad or missing data, so you know it's bad or it's missing, you advance the slide. Um, the, uh, the one up from that is you you have um, you have some data, but it, you don't know about the accuracy of that data. And if you go up from there, you have a kind of estimated result. Um, so you don't necessarily have um, a direct measurement, but you have an estimate of that measurement. And um, up from there is a uh, some compromise in the measurement is kind of known, but um, you still got a measurement there and. Up from there is a kind of reserved for the best results given the technology, and that's the wording they use. Um, so it's a bit of an objective, subjective thing, um, but that's kind of where I started from for automatically kind of tagging each of these analyzed results um, into one of these categories and different subsections of those categories. Yeah, so advance from there. Um, so we have some clues within the system to kind of indicate uh, what quality each measurement is. So you've got obviously how much kind of optical flow measurement coverage you have across that cross section. So you know how, how visible the motions are, like what percentage of the cross section you can actually see motions across. Um, and then you also have, you know, if your discharge rating curve is making sense, if it's converged on a, on a solution that makes sense, and then if your raw velocities are also in agreement with either stuff that you've seen before, um, you're expecting to see it at that water level, or if um, it's even agreeing with your, your um, kind of surface profile model, um, if that fits, if that's actually fitting very well or not. And then you also have, if you've measured it at the time, or if you're just estimating it from the water level or interpolating it. So uh, from there, um, yeah, so the, the best possible then is we've, I just flagged that as A1 if we've got all our checks passed. And then down from there is if we've got kind of one compromise in that, either our raw measurement is in disagreement with that. So we could have like a bit of wind gust on the surface or, um, or some duck is kind of interfering with us uh, or the kind of learning discharge rating is not, not converged yet. Um, or, uh, yeah, you have the kind of estimated results. So you've either got poor visibility of the flow of the optical surface, 
motion and or you've got no raw optical flow result at all so you might it might be pitch black at night you haven't put your ir light on but it's estimating it from the discharge rating curve based on some external water level source of data and then you've got kind of yeah the unknown accuracy if you've only got one element supporting the measurement um one of those elements supporting the measurement and then bad or missing is if you've failed all the checks and um or it's just missing yeah so move on from there uh, yeah, so that's the kind of matrix it comes up with. We can move on from there. You can ask me about it later if you want. How am I doing for time? Uh, we've got uh, three minutes. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah if you, like, it's up to you, really. We, we've, we've allocated five minutes for questions, so if you want to wait until your questions, yeah, we can stop, stop there. Yeah. I think we can, we can pretty much stop there if you want. Yeah, we've got. Um, this were the this is a slide from the EGU meeting in May 2022. So we mostly had trial sites across the eastern seaboard of Australia. Um, if you advance the slide from there, uh, we kind of expanded the trial sites a little bit more. Um, and yeah, I can probably leave it there. Sure. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, the can we go to the um the Third last slide. Uh, <laughs> just keep going, I'll tell you when. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm um, getting close now. This one? Oh, that one. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. one, thank you. That's the paper. It's open for discussion to test if you want to go check it out and read a bit more. No, it's wrong with the results. Okay, we can uh, go back <laughs> one, <laughs> go back another one, uh, go back, and back. Yeah, just roll that one. Um, press play on that. Uh, uh, I think you can just uh, hit the right. Yeah. Uh, next should work. Uh, maybe back oh, back no. in the next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alex. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. Just um, I think that when you use only one camera, uh, one of the big assumptions with the auto rectification is to assume that the space is flat. Yeah, yeah. And that is the assumption. You do the same assumption even with the stereo imaging. And yeah. why, why can't you use the real shape of the instantaneous um, real shape of the yeah. reverb to correct those three really effects? Because I think Mark will show, show us some nice reverb with waves of. Um, yeah, definitely. Few meters, so you need to correct that. So, do you think that it would be possible with stereoscopic images to correct that? Um, yeah, that? so initially, um, I started like, yeah, look, looking at all that, um, all the kind of what the water surface was looking like in the stereo kind of survey. Um, and that wasn't really reliable um, enough, like during all different lighting conditions and flow conditions. Um, so yeah, we've just been using the um, the kind of flat plane assumption, um, and yeah, from there um, in the raw results across, like if you've got like undulating waves, you can see that in the raw velocities, um, and so I think there might be something there to be able to signal process that out, um, work out what that, that uh, what's going on in those waves, yeah. In the future. Hey. All right. Um, does, does your system work at night? Um it it does, yeah. So uh the I guess for actually measuring the flow, you have to have quite a bit of flow to see it on the IR. Um yeah, so we had we do have examples of that. Sorry, I didn't show you any um, but yeah, mostly um, it's just trying my best to measure the water level at night to get back to our discharge rating curve um, and um, relying on external data if you have it as well. Do you think so, there's potential to you know, there's, with better there's cameras? Definitely, to, yeah, with better cameras, definitely. Want. We've got quite a poor quality for low light camera. Um, but yeah, low light measurements. So yeah, there's quite a lot of potential for using better cameras. Um, yeah, we've got some machine vision bachelors on my desk somewhere waiting to be trialed. Yeah. Once I finish my PhD. Uh, some hard work question. Um, yeah. 
So it's interesting to have the jets on the stop of what you describe. Um, yeah, it's just used for, so part of the, um, it's done, so it encodes, it's doing the encoding of the videos when it's, when it's recording it. Yeah, we're doing some trials of the onboard processing now for the Queensland government, kind of in the remote sites. Um, but yeah, um, that's very early days. Yeah, we've got to work out power <laughs> budgets and heat budgets. Um, yeah, power consumption, yeah. Um, yeah, so with those batteries, um, without onboard processing, you can last a week without solar power input, any power input, um, which is kind of what we were driving towards, putting as much batteries in there as we can. Because, yeah, quite often you don't have solar power when you need it uh, during a large event and you want to measure quite frequently. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. How often do you do that? Uh, somewhere between, yeah, five and 15 minute intervals, yeah. Anything? Oh, yeah, Nick, um, question about the cross sections. Do you have like a process for choosing an optimal kind of transect? Um, I mean, it's quite a large, it's going to be the same for any any of these methods, really, I guess. Yeah. Quite a large field of view. Um, shouldn't make too much difference, really, I guess, but I mean, to reduce uncertainty, do you have any kind of way of doing that? Or do you, can you choose multiple transects and get that? Yeah, so you, you can run um, like, <laughs> so the, I guess the, the back end system, um, you can set up multiple analysis branches. So any video the camera records can be split into parallel processing of different configurations. So you can analyze different sections at the same time. Um, uh, but yeah, so yeah, and even yeah, as the water level increases, your um, your your kind of analysis boundaries can increase with it if you configure that as well. Yeah. All right. Is that yeah. it? Um, right. Yeah. Alex, you're, you're next. Yeah. 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 Can I move on? You're next. Just to comment, when you try to to uh, use bathymetry to to interpolate velocity, what you are doing is that it's going to be bad velocity. So we use yeah, trying to fit yeah. the. I think it will be quite challenging to record because you don't know the bathymetry rules, but I mean it can change. So yeah, that's it's right. hard to, to infer the velocity from some, something that you don't do. And you can also probably be, I mean, during flood, you can have like bad water effects, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And change the water, the velocity distribution. Yeah, so you can turn that model off. Yeah. In, if you just use the kind of velocity that you see. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Dick. Thank you. Next up, we have Alex Ouellette, who's going to talk about complex flows around dams. And just to mention, we have a discussion session at the at the end, just before lunch. So if you do have questions that are likely to be into the next presenter's time, yeah, okay. uh, save them for that. Yeah, Alex, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Alex Ouellette, and uh, Nick was saying that image methods are used both by scientists and by practitioners. And I, I'm just a mix of that because I'm working half time at EDF, which is Electricity of France, the French producer of electricity. And I'm also a half-time and associated professor with the University of Grenoble. Oh, and, oh, sorry. yep, that's fine. What I want to talk about this morning is, um, is a very applied use of image-based method that we do at EDF. And we will see how we can use both uh, ADCP, so here from remote control boat, and LSPID from drones. To be able to, to, to do mapping of complex flow areas. So, Nick, you think you talked about that this morning, but it's, I think it's a big strength of the image method that they are able to, to map large areas of velocity. So, we will not talk about discharge, but only about velocity. Next one, please. So, where we are, we are in France uh, and we are looking at the Canarache Reservoir. So, it uh, it's, has the shape of a bin, uh, like we did this morning in this. English breakfast, uh, but it's a big bin. It's uh, two kilometers by one kilometer, so. and uh, it's a very important uh, reservoir for EDF because uh, so we have downstream. So downstream the, the reservoir, we have the Canal de la Durance with five hydropower plants. Um, we it's also very important for agricultural withdrawal and for drinking water. It's a very dry part of France. 
Upstream, it's a mountainous area, so we have a lot of sediments arriving at the, the reservoir. And at the outlet of the, the Durance Canal, uh, there is the Pond of Bear, which is a very sensitive natural area uh, we need to protect, and that must have low sediment incomes. So the reservoir here has two main functions. The first one is to control the discharge for the hydropower production. And the other one is to be able to, to settle the sediment. So the sediment are supposed to be de deposited on that reservoir so that we only have, uh, not only, but we have mostly fresh water without sediment going downstream. Next one, please. Yeah. Thank you. So the, the reservoir can work on, uh, with three different modes. So you can see here the, the reservoir, uh, you have the river coming here, there is a dam, and here there are three gates, those gates, one, two, three, uh, and there is another gate here on the side channel, here is the side channel. So the first operating mode is what we call the settling mode, uh, so if you go on the next one, please, yes, on the settling mode, we close the gate of the side channel and we open the three gates, so those three gates are open, this one is closed. We open the three gates for the reservoir, so the water is going into the reservoir, the velocity is decreasing, and the sediment are settled in the reservoir. And then there are water without sediment that join the river, join the, the canal downstream. So that's the first one. The second one is called the bypass. You can go to oh, the one, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And bypass is the opposite. Uh, we close the three gates of the reservoir. We open the gates of the side channel, and the water is just flowing through. So there is no sediment deposition, uh, but all the water is flowing. And the third mode is the next one, please. The mixed. It's a mixed mix that we open both the reservoir gate and the side channel gate. And you have the, the water going through the side channel and through the reservoir. OK. Next one, please. So the objective of the study is to find um, the more efficient operating modes uh, to optimize the reservoir management and especially uh, maximizing the sediment settling. That's what we want for the for the pond of air, which is the idea of it. So how to do that? We we won't play with the reservoir opening the gates and closing. It's supposed to produce electricity, so we cannot do whatever we want. So we use a numerical model to be able to play a lot of different scenarios, uh, but. When we started doing the model, uh, we found that there were very high uncertainties for the model parameters. Especially, we didn't know exactly what the discharges of the three entering gates uh, were. We didn't know what was the distribution of velocities into the reservoir, if there were some recirculating area, for example. And we didn't know neither what was the velocity distribution at the reservoir outlet. That's why we needed those uh, accurate field measurements uh, of discharge and velocity mapping. And we did that for both the settling and the mixed mode. OK, next one. So what we, what we did is that we conducted ADCP measurements. So I hope one of you knows what ADCP is, but it's uh, equipment using ultra intrasonic uh, waves to measure uh, velocities and discharge. Uh, so we measured discharge at the entrance of the, of the channel, uh, and then the discharge of each gate of the reservoir and also the discharge in the, in the side uh, channel. We also measured with ADCP the velocity distribution in the reservoir, so following a pass here, uh, and close to the inlet and the outlet of the reservoir. Next one, please. So the ADCP was deployed uh, from a classical boat. So you can see here that we have a boat with people inside, and they are using a, it's a TRDI Stream Pro uh, 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 side with the, with the boat. And we also use a remote, control, remote control boat. Uh, and you can see that it's very different. I mean, here we have three people uh, for deploying an ADCP. Here it's only one guy uh, with, the, with the remote control. So it's easier to deploy. You can also make measurements very close to gates, for example, which are quite dangerous to do with classical boats. So you can access to, to more measurements. Uh, yeah. And then we analyze the data using the velocity mapping toolbox uh, developed by the USGS. For the, for the image-based method, so we, we use videos recorded uh, with, um, with a drone. It was a UAV DJI 92, and you can see it here. And we were recorded images at the entrance of the reservoir and at the outlet of the reservoir. 
uh, we use the, we process the, the result with Tudal SPIV uh, using the scaling mode uh, and using some targets to, to have distances over the reservoir. Okay, so some results now, please next slide. So you can see here the LSPIV results uh, from, the, from the UAV. And here it's some ADCP uh, cross-section measurement. So you can see the advantages of having the two measurement systems that with the LSPIV, you have this large scale area, which is mapped. So you can see how the velocity is going, what are the main flow patterns. So you can see here that for the settling mode, so here the gate is closed, and you can see that most of the discharge flow through gate two and three, uh, quite nothing flow through gate one. And you can see also that the, the structure of the flow is more coherent in the gate three, where it's very perpendicular to the gate and it stays perpendicular a long time. And the ADCP on the other side uh, gives very local measurements and some transects, but it gives the 3D um, profile. So it's very complementary to have LSPIV and ADCP measurement. Next one, please. So then you can see here from the LSPIV and the ADCP how the velocities uh, are structured in the reservoir. So here's the gates. And then we have a deeper part of the, of the reservoir where the velocities are uh, decreasing and then increasing again. And then most of the velocities, um, most of the flow follow a deeper channel in the reservoir and the velocities are decreasing all along the channel before reaching the outlet. Okay, next one. And same thing for the outlet of the reservoir. With the LSPIV, you have this nice overview of how the velocities are, um, are mapping. So very few velocities here, and then all the velocities arriving on the right bank of the channel and joining the side channel here. And the ADCP transect gives the, yeah, the 3D view uh, of the of one cross section. We did the same for the mixed mode, so I won't go into detail. I hope you understand the advantages of having both LSPIV and ADCP. You can see here that at the entrance of the reservoir, the velocity is very different. You have most of the velocities going directly through the side channel, very few of them going into the reservoir, and most of the velocity, most of the flow going through gate three and quite nothing in gate one and two. Yeah, I think. Okay, so when we have to deal with those complex hydraulic structures, uh, numerical model is a great tool because you can play a lot of different scenarios. But you can see that it's a very complex hydraulic stru structures with, um, I mean, three gates for the entrance and then recirculating area. So it, it, it requires accurate field measurement to be well parameterized. Uh, so we had to conduct this uh, velocity mapping campaign and we decided to use LSPAV and ADCP to have this. 2D large scale and also the transect 3D using the ADCP. Uh, we have to do it very quickly uh, because, as I said before, we have five hydraulic power plants uh, downstream. So we cannot, I mean, we cannot play for weeks with that. And it costs a lot of money for my company if we just change the flow. So we had to do it in a, with a under pressure time. Uh, so it was nice to have uh, UAVs and remote control boats to. To, 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 to be able to do it efficiently. Yeah, so that's very essential data for improving the numerical model. That's all, so hope you have a question. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the matching between the ADCP and the LSPIV. Yeah. Yeah, it's not very easy. In that case, we didn't try to, to, com to compare the two methods. You know, ADCP cannot measure close to the free surface uh, because there is this blanking distance. And in the case of complex hydraulics like that, we have a lot of 3D velocities. So it's not easy to try to extrapolate the ADCP result up to the surface. So we can just see that it seems to, I mean, it seems to match pretty well. I mean, it's in the same range of order. It seems to be okay. Uh, when ADCB sees high velocity, we have also a high velocity with SPIV, but we didn't try to, to, like, to see if it was a perfect matching between, between the two, mainly because the hydraulic is very complex. Mm -hmm.
Did, did you have any issue with traces in the uh, reservoir? Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, you can see that. So we, you can see that we didn't make any LSPIV measurement in the reservoir because it's just like still water. So we have no tracer at all. Uh, we are on the Rhone Valley in France. It's very windy. So we can have also a lot of ripples due to winds that will create some patterns that are not following the velocity of the water, but the, the wind velocity. So we only focused the LSPIV analysis where we have velocities, so close to the gate entrance and close to the outlet. And it was not possible to conduct uh, LSPIV in the reservoir. We sometimes put some artificial seeding, uh, like we use corn chips, uh, which are biodegradable. So you can, but then it's always, I mean, you try to use a non-intrusive method, but you have to have, because if you want to use corn chips, you need to put a lot of those. It's, uh, it's two kilometers by one kilometer. So you need to have like <laughs> those of boats with people throwing corn chips in the water. So it's not really non-intrusive anymore. Uh, it can be quite hard to do that. And for that example, it, as I said, for safety reason, it was very hard to put some boats in the, in the rear. So I think that we will have a presentation of Hamish Biggs that developed a drone feeder of corn chips. Uh, that can be a good idea. But same thing, if you need to have a nice uh, tracer density on an area of two kilometers by one kilometer, I mean, it, it will make a lot of corn chips. <laughs> Did you struggle with the uh, magnetic interference with ADCP uh, near the gates? Yeah, that was uh, an issue with the ADCP, yes. So uh, what we did is that uh, we use a total station. Yeah. I mean, we only make transects. And so, so the question of Mike, for those who are not used basically with ADCP is that uh, we use a GPS on the ADCP, but the ADCP at its own compass, uh, also it's a magnetic compass. So if you go close to a, to a gate, it will can bias the compass and it can bias the, the direction of the velocity. So to, to, to try to avoid that, we use a location using a total station uh, to, to define the real way of the ADCP and try to correct that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's an issue when you are close to those gates, yeah. Yes. So the drones, when you threw the drones, did you find particular spots where the drone provided quite a bit in velocity and in other spots because of the way the sun? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we try to conduct the measurement when we had no sun glares and no sun reflection. So you had to find the good time spot during the day. We know that we have one day to conduct the measurement. So it was quite easy to say, OK, let's make the measurement in the morning or in the evening when we don't have some sun glares. Uh, so there are not a lot of problems with sun glares. The, 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 the issue we have was due to the wind. So we try to make the measurement in the morning because we have less wind in the morning than in the afternoon for that site. And as I said before, the problem of the, of the seeding, where when we are in the reservoir, there is no more seeding. So that's why we just focused on the entrance and outlet of the, of the reservoir. And it's a very windy part of France. So sometimes it can be hard to just to deploy the drone. I mean, when it's blowing in the very fast wind, you cannot, you cannot use the drone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Might be a simple question, I don't know, but so it's such a large um, water body. How do you decide the, the height of the drone? Obviously with a, with a river, you see the river below you. you yeah. Have a view. Do you do multiple heights or even to catch traces, can you go lower or? Yeah, so I, I don't know if you can come back to one of the. Oh, yeah, which uh, one would yeah. you uh, come back? And, I don't know which one, but uh, not before. Yeah. So, in fact, we, it's, yeah, I think maybe the third one or the. So, oh, previous. Yeah, previous. Oh, sorry, it's again. It's again. Uh, yeah, so those are the, I mean, the colors are uh, depending on the field of view of the drone for different flights. So you can see that we have one fly that recorded that, one for that, one for that, one for that. So we have different uh, height of flights. It was also uh, challenging because we are on a part of French which is not too far from an airport. So we were not allowed to fly the drone very high. I think it was maybe 60 meters as maximum. Um, yeah, so we had to deal with that. And you can see that we have to make several recordings. And then using FUDEL SPIV, you can use a um, global coordinate system for each of the measurements. So then at the end, you can just merge all the measurements together. Cool. 
Did you always use an alley view? Straight down view? Yes, yeah, that's what we did. Uh, just because it's easier for the orthorectification. But sometimes, uh, and also because for this very specific entrance and outlet areas, we had enough visible tracer. Sometimes it can be useful to have an oblique angle just to see more ripples or more like turbulence pattern in the river. But it was, I mean, it was okay like that. So it's much more easier uh, just to do the auto rectification using a scaling mode and not to have those 2D or 3D rectification. Uh, yeah, so that's that's a big advantage of using drones that you just put the camera to pointing to the nadir and you don't just have to scale the images. Um, uh, someone in the chat, uh, oh. Derek Baruta asked, was HiPack considered for this study? Oh, yeah, I mean, we don't use HiPack because we are not trained for HiPack. Uh, so it was not considered for that study, but I think it's also a good solution, yeah, for, I mean, for merging the EDCP results and everything that. A good idea. Here we just use the so the velocity mapping toolbox, and then we put the result in the QGIS software to put everything in the same coordinate system. But HiPad could be a nice solution. Okay. Uh, a lot of questions. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next up we have, uh, I think, not one but two. Dion, I'm terrible at pronouncing that name, so two of them have come just to really challenge me. Um, and you're talking about continuous measurement of discharge, yeah? Yeah, okay, brilliant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> good morning. I am Guillaume Nord from the University of Grenoble. Uh, I will present this work, uh, which is the results of mastership students, and with the help of my colleagues of the Institute of Environmental Geosciences in Grenoble. So this is about calculation, calculation of continuous time series of discharge based on non-contact instruments in an alluvial river in the southern Alps of France. Next, please. So the context is very known for everyone here, but so many applications need the, the value of discharge <clears throat> in many fields around us. Uh, I will not spend a lot of time on, on this, but I am located in this uh, area of uh, research because I am an hydrologist and we need some, some discharge value for our studies. So some application needs some instantaneous discharge measurements well done here, once again. Uh, but since the last two decades, we have been appeared also the non-contact gauging methods like the SVR and the LSPIV methods. And, but other applications uh, need a time series of discharge. Uh, and for that, we can use the, the proxy variables like the water level, but more recently also the, the, the velocity. So I will put the focus on the uh, stations equipped with uh, non-contact instruments. Next, please. <clears throat> so first, the, the context of the conventional hydrometric station with uh, radar systems to monitor the, the water, the time series of water level. In this kind of uh, station, we can perform some uh, current uh, current meter gauging like this, just to <clears throat> establish a stage discharge rating curve uh, that will be uh, quite uh, dense in this lower part of the lower level, water level, but quite poor in the higher range. So if we have uh, the opportunity next, we will add some, uh, we will add some uh, non-contact gauging methods just to uh, measure uh, discharge in this area of the water level range, and we will get a better uh, state discharge rating curve. And with that, <coughs> we will we will provide what I want to get as a, an hydrologist, <coughs> which is a time series of discharge with. Uh, 
an, an, an uncertainty range, which will depend on the stage discharge curve we, we choose. But the disadvantage of this method is, is that it is cost, costly, it is time consuming, labor intensive, and sometimes hazardous during floods, especially. And above all, next, it is an applicable in the case of unstable rivers, like uh, the one illustrated in this slide, where the river beds changed, changed dramatically between two floods in less than two months. So we have to find other methods to, 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 to provide time series of discharge in this condition. And the velocimetric station approach is an attempt to, to improve this, 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 this situation. So in addition to the water level sensor, <clears throat> we will add a radar sensor to perform a continuous time series of surface velocity at one point. It has the advantage of being both economical and still non-contact. And then the method to get to the discharge time series is to transform the local velocity to a mean channel velocity on one hand, and on the other hand, to transform the radar <clears throat> water height to a weighted area. And then by multiplying the two terms, we will get the discharge at any, any time step. So next. <clears throat> For the rating uh, between uh, radar velocity and uh, U mean, the mean channel velocity, different methods uh, have been uh, proposed, like the well known index velocity method, which appeared in the US, but also the parabolic distribution model by Mauro Marco, and also some theoretical approaches like the Isoval method which is uh, an analogy of uh, an electromagnetic uh, law, and also the entropy method, which is a probabilistic method. So in, in this study, we, we, we propose a new empirical method based on the uh, uh, max uh, surface velocity, and we use automatic LSPIV gauging. We will test also the Isoval method, using only topographic data. And then we will put, we'll try to produce continuous discharge time series during flood periods in an alluvial river prone to frequent bathymetric shifts using little gauging and no traditional gauging. So next slide, please. In the literature, we find uh, many studies showing a good uh, ratio, a good uh, rating between U min and V max. Uh, here, we will assume that the V surface mix is a, is a good proxy of V max. And we will build, uh, we'll try to build a linear relation between Vs max and U min. And we want to check that this relation can withstand bathymetric shifts. So next. We will rely on the data set uh, of uh, an observatory in the Southern Alps of France called Drex Bleon, which is an erosion and hydrological observatory, which is part of the French critical zone infrastructure called OSCAR. So in this uh, observatory, we have two uh, stations, one conventional <laughs> hydrometric station, uh, since 2007 at the outlet of a 19 square kilometer catchment. And in 1918, we added a second station, this one, a velocimetric station called Ripple here, uh, at the outlet of the uh, 34 square kilometer, still on the same river. For this second station, we have both uh, radar uh, H and V uh, radar measurement every 10 minutes. And during floods, we record uh, 10 seconds uh, video every 30 minutes. So next. So we will, the, 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 the method we propose is to uh, develop a calibration 
based on LSPIV discharge measurements between the VS max and the UMIL in the LSPIV cross section based on the LSPIV measurements. But as our uh, V radar is not located in the same uh, cross section, we will have to add a second rating, please, next, between the local velocity and the VS max. Uh, so next, for that, we will rely on the LSPIV analysis using the FUDA uh, software 1.8.2. We selected uh, 69 videos uh, for this period of uh, two and a half years. And we will obtain the surface velocity field, especially the VS max and its location. And we will calculate the, the discharge uh, and the UMIN using the alpha coefficient and the weighted area. Uh, we will change the weighted area uh, according to the, to the period. So next. So in terms of period, we use the HV uh, radar uh, re relation to detect the bathymetric shifts. Uh, indeed, once we change the curve, it means that there is a bathymetric shift. So we uh, perform a new bathymetric survey. And it can see it in the next, in the HV time series where we can distinguish between uh, different periods for the water level and velocity. And you can see next that there are some, also some gaps of data, data missing because of the challenge of the sites. For example, this photo illustrates that uh, some floods uh, deposited a lot of sediment just below the radars and we, we lost the, 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 the data. So we, we had to adapt it to, to adapt the, the system in to, 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 to get some data after that. <clears throat> Next. So this is the results of the LSPIV analysis, uh, the 69 uh, uh, videos. We get the VS max, the UMIN in the LSPIV cross section. We also uh, get the H and V radar values at the same time step. And we, we, we indicate the, the bathymetry we use for, for this uh, calculation. Next. So this is the uh, V uh, radar human rating we get with the, the data. Uh, we were happy because the, the rating was uh, stable. It could, it could cross all the, all the periods. Um, and also the location of the V max was quite uh, stable within the, the cross section. Uh, so this is uh, interesting results. And the second rating needed in, in this case, because of the, the radar uh, far from the, well, not so far, but in a different cross section, we had, we, we had to build uh, a second rating be between the radar and VS max. And in this case, we had to distinguish between two groups of periods with two different ratings. The rating is a bit less uh, good statistically. That's why we conclude that it, it would be preferable in the future to, to install the velocity radar right in the LSPIV section at the location corresponding to, to the VS max, if possible. So next. We also try to, to build the VS max human rating using the ISOVEL method which is a quite known method, which only uses uh, bathymetric data. And we got the red uh, rating in this case, which, is, which can be compared with, with our results presented just before. So we can see that the two ratings are quite similar, which is a good point that maybe the ISOVEL method can um, predict the location of the VS max and the, the, the slope of the rating. Okay, next. 
In the end, we calculated the discharge time series using this formula and using the two methods, the new uh, proposed method and the ISOVAL method. And we got such uh, results. So this is just uh, for a single flood uh, for the two methods and the observed uh, LSPA gauging. And on the right, the direct comparison between estimated discharge and observed uh, LSPA discharge. So next to have a, a, a global next slide please an overview of the of the results we uh, use the upstream uh, conventional hydrometric station to compare with the, the the velocity metric station in terms of specific discharge so we we plot the the two station and there is a third one but i, I haven't spoken about it about it here but the results are quite consistent during the the floods uh, sometimes a little bit less during the recessing line of the of the of the flood, but this is uh, this give us confidence in our results. In the discharge time series of the velocimetric station, I divided in two subsets the data with good confidence. Next, please, when the velocity is higher than point. 85 meter per second, and in red, data with lower uh, confidence for low flow conditions because of the scattering of the, the measurement and also because of local uh, control. Next, please. So in conclusion, um, we can say that it, it, it seems possible to calculate continuous QT for an alluvial station like this prone to frequent uh, topo topographic shifts, just based on HV radars and LSPAV automatic gauging and also topographic surveys, at least for flood periods. And at least I, I would say for medium to bank full discharges. Um, we show the HV relation, which is uh, useful to detect bathymetric changes and plan for new topographic survey. We also demonstrated the importance of direct measurement of VSMAX and the robustness of the VRAD VSMAX rating. Uh, both methods are not applicable for, for low flow because of these uh, problems, I would say. Uh, the the ISOVAL method could predict well the location of VSMAX and it has maybe the potential to provide QT just based on bathymetric survey and HD radar if the cross section is correctly uh, selected in space, I would say, according to hydraulic uh, consideration. But we still need to evaluate the uncertainties of, of these approaches. And the paper is uh, uh, on under writing at the moment about that. Okay, thank you for your attention. There was a message in the chat. No, on that. Just uh, no, oh, it's okay. Oh, yeah, it's you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jerome says we also found that surface velocity radar stations and any index velocity station is great for detecting rating shifts from changes of the VINDEX V mean relation. Detection of rating shifts can be done in real time before new gauges or measurements are available. Um, yeah, but uh, we no. want to say that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got time for questions. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. Uh, I don't know what to say. Thank you. <laughs> uh, just one question about uh, if there are any requirements about the shape of the ridge of the river, like it should be uniform for a long ridge to be sure that the location of the maximum velocity is always at the same place. And also to be sure that the isoval method would work. I could imagine that if you have maybe singularities in the cross section, maybe it, it could change with the water depth and the isoval will not perform so well. Or do you have some like the yeah, requirement about the shape of the river? Well, we, we have to, to choose a, a linear uh, ridge uh, for that. 
and with the control by the by the slope, uh, it's, it's important to, to 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 follow these conditions at least. And I would say we have to stay between uh, uh, below the bound full discharge. Uh, it will not uh, work like this for a major flood. Uh, yes, that's the condition. A similar question. Um, it must be quite challenging if you have your radar and your camera set for different angles. So if the river changes height, find the correct um, area where the velocity is to get from. You measure in the same spot. So obviously, if it gets higher, the angles will mean you're measuring velocity from different places. You mean because of the angle of the radar? Yeah. So you've got your camera up here and your radar down here. Okay, okay. okay. So yeah, the height changes. Um, yes, it, but if if it is, um, I would say if the, if the ridge is quite uniform, uh, we can assume that it is representative of the of the two sections. Uh, in our case, we could not use the the V radar as a good representation of the LSPAV cross section because of the hydraulic jump we had below the the bridge, but. Uh, what I am working on at the moment is to place the radar on cables just to be right at the position of the LSP cross section. Just a, it's just a little question about the 69 uh, videos. Yes. You did they analyze all the videos yeah. manually or? What with the uh, stadium? I'm part of the internship too. Yes, yes. But it's about uh, between 20, 25 minutes per video. That's what we concluded. Yeah. Yes. So, um, from the strict, strictly operational point of view, uh, is this something you hope to operationalize across several stations, or do you think it's it's a viable? The, the, the support. Oh yeah. The I idea is that you need a master student. No, but <laughs> no, no. The, the idea, the idea of the LSPIV is to to test the the method, mm -hmm. and then maybe in. Uh, in the future, we will try to perform uh, just using uh, velocity radar and uh, water level radar to, to provide uh, an estimation of uh, Q time series. So this is a, uh, we need different sites with the same equipment just to, to validate the, the method. Mm -hmm. And in the future, we will try to, to, to apply the method uh, uh, in a, in a light uh, mode. <laughs> so not so many videos. No, because I consider that it is a, a lot of expertise and a lot of time. So it cannot be applied everywhere because the idea is to 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 to, to develop uh, more uh, engaging stations for modeling application or for different uh, uh, requirements. And that's the that's just a transition. Entire last year at the end. Please do. Thank you very much, Neil. Okay, good. Well, we next have Hamish Biggs, who I think is a video contributor yes. to this. Yeah, yeah. Hamish from Neewa, New Zealand, is always doing some really crazy innovative stuff. But I have a question for all the French present. What is this obsession with Chuck Norris among <laughs> French hydrologists? <laughs> Maybe we can discuss in the discussion session later on. But yeah. Uh, Hamish, he may be a video presentation, but he's bound to be entertaining. I think he sorry has all sorts of creative solutions. I'll just talk whilst the yeah. We have a slight technical glitch here. Chuck Norris with, with no. I don't even know what, what is that from a movie? Is that yeah, it's Chuck Norris thing? No, he's healed. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. I thought it originated. Yeah. 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 It's a good opportunity for a comfort break, yeah. probably, if anybody wants to. Yeah. 
It's just not going into the loop. It's just not going into the loop. It's just not going into the loop. It's just not going into the uh, if you go on this way, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, sorry for the hold up, but I think we are now ready to go with Hamish Beach's presentation. Hello everyone, I'm Hamish from Niwa, New Zealand, and today I'll be talking to you about uh, surface wall symmetry in Niwa and some new projects with stereoscopic camera stations and symmetry for the area of around penetrating radar. Niwa have recently released the drone flow user guide, which was due this year. Um, it contains a lot of methods for robot sensing and surface wall symmetry. Um, we primarily developed it for councils and stakeholders in New Zealand. However, it's uh, probably of interest to a wider international audience as well. Uh, the sections that cover things like equipment, mission planning, methods for service wall symmetry, aerial surveying, poetry. Uh, there's quite a lot of literature review in there. Software tools, CAD files for equipment, and a lot more. So, if people are interested, feel free to go and get a copy of that. So an example of the equipment that we developed and it's covered in the user code is the tracer particle distribution system. And so that was developed uh, for deployment in rivers with insufficient natural tracer particles for surface or symmetry. And the user guide contains CAD files and information about how to make such a system. And um, here it is constructed and there's also information about speed controllers, motors, um, and yeah, and how to control it. And here's the system box up ready for deployment. The user guide also includes information about how to obtain cross sections for moving both ADCD gaugings. Um, if measurements occur across the cross section and they're referenced using a uh, bottom track or BPG, for example, and uh, they're then projected onto a cross section defined between. The start and end points of the transect. And the cross section can then be visualized uh, with the um, distance references that are available. And it's common to see some discrepancy between these distance references. The um, cross section can then be rescaled to a user defined cross section width that's been measured uh, using another way, such as server RDK GPS. Uh, or the user can select. Which uh, distance reference to use, and then um, the other distance reference will be rescaled to that width. And so you can see here that uh, the cross section is nicely fit uh, for rescaling. Um, usually, when, when doing discharge, for example, four or six transects or eight transects might be, uh, might, be, might be taken to obtain discharge. And so, again, that provides extra information for obtaining a more accurate cross section. So all of those uh, transects can be overlaid on top of each other. Um, any uh, discrepancies between them can be detected, and then the best transects can all be selected for averaging with the final output cross section. The user guide will also include methods for using RTK and GPS and narrow beam depth sounders for um, uh, this imagery as well. Processing is similar where the depth measurements are projected onto a cross section uh, with a start and finish point, um, and then the data is resampled between those. And uh, yeah, you know, it's quite a good way to obtain cross sections for um, use with surface wall symmetry methods more than just general river survey. So 
and this is document that they were at least uh, maybe of interest to this audience is the field guide for selecting alpha it was released in June 2021 and it contains a lot of different methods for selecting alpha and again we developed it for councils and stakeholders in New Zealand uh, but it's, it's widely applicable and it covers techniques such as alpha from extrapolated ADCP velocity profiles alpha from site specific calibrations um, alpha from velocity profile equations and Estimating output from the site characteristics in mind and so the work flows. So again, that's publicly available. Anyone's welcome to get a copy of that if it's of use. Okay, next we'll move on to the few projects that we've got. Um, so the first one that is the development of stereoscopic camera stations in the Pacific, and that's a project for W Lawrence. And the design uh, or the objective is to have stereoscopic camera stations that are triggered by water level or time lapse more manually. And we want to be able to obtain the top end of the rating curve in a single flood event. So in the Pacific, there's currently a complete lack of high flow and flood data, uh, which creates a lot of uncertainty for um, generating downstream flood water. <laughs> And also this validation for flood modeling, for sort of flood modeling. And it needs to operate streams in sort of remote locations where, where staff can't get to easily. And also the sites from the forest and the tree cover. And the objective is also have 4K cameras and a wide field of view for those, uh, yeah, for those sites. And the idea is that there were two cameras, and camera one will record imagery about the surface velocity, so it'll be one minute videos, and then camera two will record um, a still image uh, for three reconstructions, a stereoscopic reconstruction in conjunction with the, the, with the cross point image from, from the primary camera. And the objective of this work is that ground control points uh, won't be needed due to. Uh, so 3D reconstruction of points along the water's edge and survey angles are uh, what you need. So that's quite important in the Pacific when there's a lack of equipment, um, such as RDK GPS is not widely available um, on the Pacific Islands. Now, if anyone interested in the hardware, feel free to pause the video um, if you're watching this at a later date. And this is the, the hardware that we're using for the design. So this W Mobile project's just recently started, and so we're at the development stage at the moment. And one of the main scientific objectives, uh, as mentioned, is auto rectification and collect imagery without needing ground control points. And so during the development phase, uh, we are using an existing stereoscopic camera that we developed as part of the drone flow project. Um, but we're using it mounted on the tripod. And um, you can see the drone for user guide this detailed information about camera development, calibration, triggering, synchronization, and um, uh, image capture algorithms. And basically, these, these cameras are, they have a, a, a PC that, that runs them, so an Intel um, uh, and then two machine vision cameras. Um, we use RGB machine vision cameras and then it's triggering batteries. So, how do we go about water replication of the leak energy without ground control points? Well, the processing steps is to first record an image sequence or a video with the primary camera for surface velocimetry. We also record a stereo image pair from the 3D reconstruction. So here is the left primary camera and the right secondary uh, camera. So those are the synchronous images. Um, we then detect and match features between the stereo image pairs. So here we're using all features. Um, and so they're, they're being picked up and matched between the two images. Um, both the camera has to be calibrated first. Um, there's a particular calibration target.
targets. And from that and the match features can be able to do 3D point reconstruction. So here you can see for the example, there are points at the near bank and the scattering points at the far bank. And those are arbitrary coordinate system which for the purpose of sort of important. And the next step is to select points at the water's edge. So that can be done on both sides of the channel. Uh, we then fit a plane through the selected points and we project those points onto the plane. And then we find the unit quaternion to rotate the plane so that the, the unit normal of the plane uh, aligns with the Z uh, direction. So it's basically converting the 3D uh, plane of data uh, into a 2D plane of data. And so that's important for uh, the imagery also verification. Then use that quaternion to rotate the plane and points. And then we use the 2D image co coordinates of the points and 2D world coordinates of the points from the 3D uh, stereoscopic reconstruction to generate a projective auto verification transform. And we then uh, use that transform to perform auto verification on the stereo here or, or under the stereo images, and that's shown here. And then we can perform auto verification of the entire image sequence or video from the primary camera. Um, the only caveat for that is that the primary camera cannot have moved during the video recording uh, process to use the same transformation. So it's, it's important to use a tripod and if there's any residual um, movement, then perform stabilization of the imagery first. So here are some examples of auto verifications. Ring is of the room dealer. This is just an example shown previously. Here's another example of auto verification. Uh, this one is in the NY car park, and it's nice and easy to visualize auto verification of the uh, checkpoint calibration target. So that project's uh, well underway and going well, and uh, it runs for one year, and so hopefully by the next serviceable symmetry workshop will have a good update of real deployments of these systems in BG. Now the next project to talk to you about is bathymetry from aerial ground penetrating radar. It's an aerial ground penetrating radar system on a DJI 360 drone. And it's just this tower group in New Zealand. And the objective of this project is to obtain cross sections during floods and to make concurrent measurements with surface velocity. So that's to obtain uh, bathymetry at the same time as surface velocities and uh, obtain bathymetry from remote sensing methods so that um, in situations it's not needed and because often it's not, it's not possible to actually get a bathymetry uh, during a large flood. And one of the primary objectives is to avoid geomorphic change to cross sections. So if um, surface velocities were measured at the flood peak, but then cross sections are surveyed after the flood, uh, that means that there's an inherent assumption that that cross section was valid at the same time as the surface velocities. And often that's, that's not correct because there can be substantial geomorphic change occurring uh, during the flood and also on the form of deposition setting. If we have a video of the ground penetrating radar unit flying in the white macro river in New Zealand. So there were flow for um, obtaining discharge from surface velocity between aerial ground penetrating radar. 
Uh, so you need to record and process surface velocities uh, using Hydro uh, stuff, which is uh, extremely, extremely useful. And again, this is the Wimaco River example. Um, it was quite a wide river, so we uh, recorded surface velocity and uh, surface velocities in two different sections um, combined together. And it can be quite useful to measure make measurements upstream from the bridge um, because then you have uh, visible references in the recorded videos for uh, stitching the surface velocities together. Um, we recorded the graphic track radar data processed it in software called GPR Slice that we're currently using. Um, we're developing a, a toolbox for the processing of data in the future, but at the moment we're using this commercially available software. And in that software, we combine the water service and water bed. Um, data is then exported from GPR Slice and then uh, processed in MATLAB. So we processed the data, sorry, we project the GPR data onto a cross section between the start and finish points and we sample it. Uh, we then add bank points with zero depth, uh, which we'll insert with the exported data, generate cross section, then combine the GPR data with surface velocities and output to obtain discharge. And so, for the example here with uh, an output of 0 0.9, since it's quite deep, uh, we obtain a discharge of approximately 750 cubics. So, this compares with the rate of discharge. ECAM is a fire on Canterbury of uh, 813.7 cubics. And it's definitely promising, it's, it's reasonably close. Um, however, we need some rigorous ground truth data. So during these initial tests, uh, we had to respond under quite short notice to, to a flood event. And so we weren't able to organize it in a jet boat with um, an ACP or, or, a, um, or a deep sounder. To provide reference discharge, so we only have the rate of discharge to compare it. Uh, there are definitely improvements that need to be made to better obtain the filtry near the banks. And so that was why we had to do some interpolation near the river banks because there were some reflections on terrestrial objects. Some deployment tips for other people. Um, it can be quite hard to see the drone near the far bank. And if you're trying to get close to the bank and just rocket and vegetation, it can be a bit risky. So it helps to have another drone and the UAV to spot the proximity. So we have two drones, two drone pilots. Um, it's also good to make measurements upstream of bridge piers so that you avoid any weight scales or three dimensional flow of a certain small symmetry and, um, and alpha. Um, again, we just sort of started work in this area that some future work that we'd like to do is to test um, rotating the one of the antennas, so the transmitter and receiver antennas are uh, orientated at 90 degrees. So that the uh, sort of donut shaped antenna gain patterns in, in the seat uh, that might sort of, uh, help us with better directionality um, data than just below the drive rather than. Through the reflections, but there might be some issues with signal polarization, so that's a quick piece that we need to do. Um, more and sort of more detailed work we need, we're looking at doing is developing ray tracing algorithms to model the through air reflection of river banks and terrestrial objects. Um, so the idea of that is if you survey the site first, um, it can be with LIDAR or most likely RGB cameras and structure from motion. Uh, we should be able to actually model the through air GPR transmissions and reflections and subtract those from the recorded data to reduce the noise uh, improve data quality near the river banks. And we also need to do a lot of detailed field work for accuracy assessment. This is ground truth from uh, ABCP and Ecosounder. Okay, so that's a bit of an update of what's going on in New Zealand at, at NIWA. Um, this space at the moment. So thanks to those projects. Uh, also many thanks to, to collaborators and people that have been helping us with this work. Um, apologies that I can't be over in the UK in person for the workshop. I'm sure it'll be an absolutely fantastic event. And it's currently in the middle of the night in New Zealand. So uh, we'll be having this conference at uh, this workshop 
some critical talk uh, and uh, the comments all us to take any questions which they will email through to me and I will respond to you directly so please include your name uh, in the questions and I may also re-record uh, the last slide of this talk before it's uploaded in the future and address your questions in that so um, thank you very much and any questions or feedback feel free to contact me and hope the rest of the workshop goes well. Thanks. So, yeah, as Henry says, it's the middle of the night in New Zealand. Um, so, if anybody has any questions, then um, yeah, uh, should, we get, should we take them now and just quickly type them down, or should we take them in the should we, should we take them after the session? Because I think we're actually slightly behind now. Yeah, yeah, so that's how I want to. Um, which means it's time for Carol. Um, Carol, would you like to introduce yourself and your, and your talk session? I can introduce myself. Uh, yeah. My name is Kirill Karoshenko from the University of Sheffield, and I'm going to present a piece of work which I, my colleague Anton Brinking learned on it. But a lot of people contributed to this, including Simon Tate, who is here, and uh, Gavin Saylor. Julia Dolcetti, who developed a model for this, and uh, people from Belgium who actually worked for KU um, Leuven and uh, in Zimbabwe. So, provided actually a wonderful um, acoustic camera to use in the experiments. I'm sorry about uh, this style of presentation. I'm told it's fixed on overleaf and latex. So, unfortunately, it's not very easy to actually transfer latex and PowerPoint. And, our laptop didn't have PowerPoint. Sorry, they didn't have um, Adobe Acrobat. Yeah. So we have to use it like that. Okay, second slide. So what I'm gonna to talk to, to you about is um, acoustic Doppler velocimetry, which is uh, taken not from uh, inside the flow, but uh, from the pattern on the surface of the flow generated by the turbulence and uh, by the other sort of uh, mechanisms which generate basically waves which move together with the flow in very peculiar pattern. And the key here is to understand how all this pattern moves and map this pattern using remote means of um, airborne sound waves, airborne sound waves, and um, to actually uh, determine the flow velocity out of these. So we talk about methodology, talk about the gravity waves in deep water, we've done some experiments to validate this methodology, and eventually we've done some field tests. People are asking me if I go out in the field sometimes, so I do. And this time I did get my feet wet, really. So, and I bought the, the proper, what are they called, uh, the waiters. The waiters after I said, because I know it's, a, it's not, not fun. And then I draw conclusions. Excellent. Thank you. So Anton put some uh, statistics about um, the problem in the case of how people from environment agency no, better these, they apparently 5.2 million properties are at risk of flooding in England alone, and there is a big annual cost of flooding, and um, people in the UK spend a lot of money to remediate this flooding, and they, some properties can't be insured, and uh, it's very hard to monitor these things, and we don't want to put anything in the floor. I can see people presenting wonderful solutions in terms of the uh, remote control vehicles using acoustic Doppler door symmetry, which is goes underneath the flow. And uh, we use optics as well, but um, there's some issues with optics. So it's nice to get um, sort of a non-expensive, accurate, reliable alternative techniques, robust and flexible to deploy. And because I'm a professor of acoustics, so I feel acoustics can be useful on many occasions. Okay, And I'll show you some evidence that can be used really useful. So the principle behind the whole thing actually, so we there are two ways of actually doing this acoustically from above the surface, which is not smooth. Normally it's not smooth because uh, all these sort of underpinning turbulent structures which develop in the flow create roughness on the surface. This surface propagates at a uh, speed, which is not necessarily speed of flow. And um, we can pick it up with a source of sound which can be ambient sound, or can be a source of sound which we uh, deploy on um, on site, and uh, array of many microphones, which basically just listen for the reflections from this. 
And this can be done either by just looking at the effect of the surface itself, so I say it goes up and down on the sound pressure measured on each of the microphones, or it can be used as by measuring the Doppler sheet, which caused by these pattern of waves propagating a certain speed. Okay. So um, we need the array of ultrasonic sensors, and uh, I don't know why I said ultrasonic actually, so we didn't use ultrasonic, we use audio, so 15 kilohertz is still ultrasonic. So we characterize the free surface in time and space, we link the, with the turbulent flow conditions. So basically we need to use some fancy Fourier transform to understand that. Most importantly, we need to use actually, so the scattering model for the um, um, surf, rough surface scattering acoustic waves, airborne acoustic waves. And good thing here, so unlike uh, radio waves or optics, so acoustic uh, waves bounce perfectly well from wood, perfectly well because the impedance contrast is massive. Everything basically comes back. And this is good for us. The only assumption here, so acoustic wavelengths has to be much bigger than the surface elevation. So it, it, as long as actually the wave amplitude is reasonably small in comparison to the acoustic wavelengths, we're okay. We can measure it quite robustly. Okay. So I'll put a bit of more model here. So my uh, colleague, Michael, so we're gonna talk more about this. And um, um, so, well, there is a yeah, basically sound pressure on each of those microphones I showed you. So effectively is an integral of the kernel, which depends only on the geometry of the problem, position of the source, position of the uh, receiver, and the roughness of the issue, where the sound bounds from. And the, this actually term here is actually the surface elevation. It's a function of uh, position on the surface and function of time. The variable n here is basically integer. So if it's zero in this case, everything comes back from the specular reflection point. If it's one, in this case, we take into account the actual elevation of the surface. But roughly speaking, this integral is approximation. It's called Kitchkov approximation. Okay, probably boring enough of this. So um, what, what they do basically, so they first of all, they uh, expand uh, the surface elevation with the, uh, with the Fourier transform, two-dimensional Fourier transform in wave number space and uh, in uh, the uh, frequency space. The wave number space here effectively is the um, um, wave number of the uh, actual, uh, not acoustic wave number, but the wave number for the waves traveling on the surface. Okay, this is gravity and uh, capillary waves. Then they uh, digitize this integral and present as a matrix here, which is multiplication of this kernel matrix of the ASO and uh, this function psi here. So, which is basically, uh, this is known, uh, this is known by this one, and this is the one we want to find. If we find this uh, matrix here, so we should be able to reconstruct the surface very well. Like not only reconstruct the surface, we should be able to reconstruct actually the uh, evolution of the surface in time. And that's very useful to us because then we can find out the actual speed that is the surface and the pattern of the surface travels. So basically, this is a complex discrete frequency wave number spectrum from of the scattering surface, the roughness itself. So this is recovered with the singular value decomposition, some kind of mathematical tool. So um, because we don't have enough microphones to recover it precisely, so we need to make assumptions. And uh, that can recover the roughness scale larger than uh, lambda uh, not, which is the wave the wavelengths of the acoustic wave. So um, the first thing we did actually, we look at uh, numerical uh, results obtained for the, through the simulation. So, okay, well, let's assume there are some pattern waves, which is harmonic traveling down away from us and back to us. So um, we uh, put a source here and set of receivers here and this bounce from these waves sound. And basically we used what we just presented on the last few slides to reconstruct uh, the uh, wave number spectrum of the surface waves. Okay, so for this one, we use a frequency of sound of 14 kilohertz, which is uh, 
not too, too high to make sure that the wave length is larger than the surface elevation. So which is 24 millimeters, which is larger than the surface elevation in this case. So anyway, all these details here, but uh, the case number one, we actually, we have a sinusoidal surface, which basically harmonic waves propagating away from us and back. And this graph shows actually uh, the, um, the spectrogram, which is um, frequency of the uh, waves traveling on the surface against the wave number of those waves. And basically, according to the theory, it's supposed to be a um, um, spot here, which is waves traveling away from us at a given speed of gravity waves, and waves traveling back because they reflect somehow. And the color map here, basically, the reconstruction of those, it is accurate. It's accurate within uh, five, ten percent, obtained uh, with the uh, thirty uh, receivers, thirty microphone positions, can be either installed. Uh, uh, with the array of microphones, or they can be simulated by flowing a drone with the microphones installed. In the, the second case was actually when we had a more complicated pattern of waves. This pattern of waves was actually similar to uh, the real waves which exist on the surface. The spectrum of which uh, was basically wave number to the power minus three, so kind of actually rolling down, so similar to a bit of turbulence spectrum. Not quite two minutes, not quite two minutes, but minus seven over two, something like that. Five over two, something like that. I'm not sure why they've done it. You can ask Anton and Julie. So, but uh, they feel actually it's close now. But again, this, the um, dashed line here is the model, the theory itself, and um, the color map here is basically the construction. Again, it's accurate within a few percent. So, in principle, yes, for a simulation, we can recover it. So then we've done a test in the wave tank. So we had a source of sound and we had an array of uh, microphones. Um, and uh, we uh, done exactly that what we just showed on the previous slide. So effectively we send the harmonic wave propagating down and it reflects back and comes back again. So they used a uh, kind of a wave maker to generate these waves. And we had a wave probe, so we knew exactly what the nature of this wave was. Next slide. And this is actually data similar to what I showed you on the slide, uh, on the slide before. So effectively, they spot, um, the marker here is to show where the uh, um, real um, estimates should be. So on the uh, frequency wave number map. And uh, the color map shows actually we can reconstruct again with a similar accuracy to what we've done in the numerical simulation in the case of harmonic waves. And the second case, we generated a similar broadband surface, like a, a K a wave number uh, to the power minus three. And actually that's, that turned out a bit more messy. Ask Anton how accurate it is, but I think it was accurate enough to the government. So uh, um, any comments on this? No, okay. So with broadband surface effectively had a you know, um, RMS estimate approximately 1.4 millimeters. So it was much less in wavelengths. Okay. And finally, what we did actually, so that's why we get ourselves really wet. So we installed an 81 microphone array provided by Siemens. It's actually, it's like an acoustic camera. So on uh, a River Loxley, nice Sheffield. <laughs> I installed it on uh, a uh, truss, which was supported by tripods. Had a speaker here, which shown the uh, um, acoustic energy onto the rough surface, and they picked it up on the uh, on the microphone array. And we tested multiple frequency for several uh, uh, in several steps, from 10 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz. Uh, okay, so the main equation here is to recover this velocity, which we really need to know um, from the experiment, um, is uh, in this one. So the this is basically a dispersion relation for a gravity capillary waves propagating on the surface of the flow. So flow velocity, wave number of the waves, the gravity, so uh, surface tension constant, density of water, and uh, water height. Water level, so what basically it, it was something uh, half a meter, so something just enough 
to go with the Wellingtons. Okay, so which is very uncomfortable. So on the floor velocity was anything between 0.4 to 0.45 meters per second, meters per second maximum. So we took it um, in summer, which was okay. So not too bad to go in, uh, in the water. It still was cold. So not very pleasant. But anyway, so it kept us going. Okay. They generated shed a lot of graphs from this. But um, the most important things in here, so that was these graphs basically is the result from the experiments taken at 0.8 meter, 1.4 meter, 1.8 meter, and 2.4 meter away from the bank of the river. So effectively, we went um, from one bank to another bank with this sort of a truss being moved. So the truss was oriented um, streamwise direction. And uh, effectively, what you see here is the green lines. Unfortunately, I don't know why Anton and Julia plot such small graphs. But anyway, so the green line is the theoretical model, which is basically represents what was shown on the previous slide. And the color maps, basically, the uh, dispersion curves, which we measured with the 81 microphone ray after the analysis um, of the data. This graph here is the uh, wave number for the gravity uh, cutting the waves in streamwise direction. And this one is a uh, lateral direction, a uh, spinwise direction. Okay? So effectively, if combined the two, we got a vector of the velocity. Okay? The slope here tells us how fast flow moves. Okay? The greater the slope, the faster it moves because effectively it's the frequency divided by a wave number, which gives us the phase velocity flow. The one we shown in the equation on the previous slide. So if we go along the river, you see it changes. So for example, this actually keeps more or less steady, but actually as we pass through the river, so then actually find uh, that's the uh, um, wave pattern is quite complex. It's actually, uh, if you look optically on this, actually on the surface, actually it's not obvious because the waves travel in a peculiar pattern. So if you try to really cover it optically, so actually you may make a mistake because uh, the pattern of waves not necessarily goes straight direction. So it goes in two dimensions and then it can be quite complex. Particularly in the river, you can get standing waves. When you got something like that, that means actually there is a standing wave going across the flow. So that means they travel at their infinite speed, infinite phase velocity. But what's nice about it, so we can measure the velocity. So from these graphs, and actually, so we can actually determine that the flow velocity generally, the maximum is about 0.4 meters per second, which much they want to try to do in the traces. Next slide. Okay. What we did as well, so we actually, we, we actually turned the camera. So first it was a uh, flow goes this way, speaker was here, array microphones was here, then we swap it. And again, when we swap it, so when the camera was downstream, so we got a slope here. That means actually flow going that way. Okay, so the camera is here, my, the speaker is here. When we take it, uh, turn it upside down, everything changed. You see the slope goes this way, which means actually the system works, no matter how we put it. Put camera here, speaker here, or swap around, it works. And actually, uh, and uh, the span wise wave number actually stays the same. That makes sense as well. So the system works. One more slide. And what we did as well, we actually said, okay, what about if we turn it actually, if we set it across the river? Okay. So we set it across the river and do exactly the same. It works again. So effectively, so basically, but now the difference is, remember, this is a, a spin, um, so this is a, a, the flow direction wave number. This is a spin wise direction wave number. They swap now. Effectively now, actually, that uh, this one looks down the flow. This one looks across the flow. So again, it does work. So it's, no matter how we turn this thing around, Imagine if you have two drones, if you just move the drones around like that, we still can actually construct the flow. Okay, so as long as there is a, um, the array is enough microphones, as long as there is a good signal to noise duration, which can achieve the total signal. And as long as actually there is a right um, um, positioning of the thing again. Okay, 
So I think it's time to draw conclusions. So acoustic Doppler together with Kitschke of integral can be used to recover frequency wave number spectrum on the three circuits. So this is by, by much based on the Doppler. There is another way to actually reconstruct it, Michael, we talk about. So uh, it we also talk about Doppler, but you can actually also use similar technology to do actually basically reconstruction of the circuits from the impression. So surface scales contribute to the spectrum are bound by half acoustic wavelength. So things are scalable. If the waves become higher and higher and higher, then the frequency of sound we use has to reduce and reduce and reduce. Okay, so to make sure that conditions are right, otherwise it won't work. Spectrum recollection will depend on the size of microphone array again. So we use microphone array, which is about it's half a meter in diameter. So I guess if everything becomes scalable, so that it can become bigger, but it can be achieved to the uh, flying drones and putting microphones in communications. The inversion is also constrained by the requirements of surface elevation to be smaller than the acoustic wavelengths. And techniques is robust and adaptable to different arrangements of the speaker and receiver arrays, no matter where, where they can give it speaker here, microphone right here, or swap it around at angles of this. And that's all I can say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Daryl. Very interesting stuff. Do we have questions for Daryl? Yes. Daniel says. Thank you for your presentation. Very, very interesting. Uh, do you think that the drone sound would interfere with your, uh, with your signal problems with signal to noise ratio? It might do, but actually at the same time, we can actually use it for our advantage. We can actually use drone sound to actually to measure the sound. So you just use the drone both hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because it's quite tone. You can use the tones just for the same people. I haven't tried it yet, but there are some theoretical models to do it. And so ocean acoustics is actually quite good one. They use a background sound to make the sea flow. So, yeah. But at the same time, it's e it's reasonably easy to achieve very high signal to noise, noise ratio with tonal sounds. Yeah. It's probably quite annoying to everyone. So, yes. Cool. Uh, similar yeah. question, actually, uh, about sort of background and that kind of thing. Environmental factors. Is, are there any extreme environmental factors that might be with the frequencies, like snow, even or rainfall? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, again, there are two ways of doing it. One is it's a uh, it, when based on Doppler, I think rainfall can interfere. Actually, Julia did this some estimates. So we didn't try it ourselves, but he did some estimates based on somebody's work. So it can interfere, but we can also use a different technique, which is not based on Doppler, which is based on Kitchhoff integral and inversion of the surface and published in papers. And that much less uh, prone to the, uh, to the rainfall because it doesn't matter how fast rainfall travels. All it could do is just Cause more attenuation of sound, but wouldn't cause a How about movement? Is that a problem or rotational movement? Uh, it should be very stabilized or? We did, did the study the actual light protection, the uncertainty in the position. So it can compensate as long as you average. Mm -hmm. So, but the uh, movement, I don't know. It has something that we, we, we want to apply for more funding to study that Lloyd and drones. And that's a factor which we need to consider. But it may interfere if it moves around. So dynamically, definitely will interfere with a Doppler when there's too much wind. Um, could you imagine an installed system for continuous measurement? And if so, how might that look in terms of how many arrays would you need and where would they be located? Install system is perfect because it doesn't move. So what on the number of microphones we tried, the minimum one it was 30 microphones when we tried to recover. In the case of uh, Zimmons cameras, 81 microphones are good. So once he, the, the more the better. Is that just giving you a reading for a particular location? If you wanted to get readings all the way across, would that give you that or would you need a- You need to have a, a plurality of speaker and receiver positions, maybe, because the array more, in this case, you need, would need to have a, maybe install array because it's more difficult to organize. Or maybe plurality of microphones spread around 
and plurality of speakers play around. Could you have it on a moving system across the top of the river? So you might be reading left bank, middle, right bank. I would guess so, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Because I want to build gantries above rivers as part of our flood and that'll be perfect. research projects. That'll be perfect because if you've got something move around the ground here, maybe one source is uh, sort of stationary, mm -hmm. microphone moved away so this for the drone. So that's 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 easily done. So again, there may be uncertainties associated with the positioning and the strong wind and things like that. So you have to compensate for it. But I think through averaging, you can get uh, very good information. Mm -hmm. Um, was it you mentioned about the interaction between the, the wave, the sound wave, and the waves? So, and there was it on limitations? How high can you put it? What is the maximum distance? What is the maximum wave? There are some rules so in the Kitchko approximation. So, something like uh, KR to the power of whatever it is, so three or something like that. So, there are some rules, but generally, you have to be in far, far, far um, field, acoustic field. So far away from the uh, specular reflection point. So um, generally, which is easy to satisfy, because you're always far away from that from the fly, not too close to the surface. So is it? Could you put a number of where it's far, where it's going too far, centimeters, meters? Well, I think I mean more in the direction of like I'm trying to do something like good like. like also, yeah. Well, the far field normally usually to do the actually again so this uh, relationship between the uh, wavelengths and distance. Normally, it's just uh, it is um, to do the um, sort of the feature you try to actually look at on the surface. So to the power of squared divided by wavelengths divided by the distance away. So we should be actually uh, much less than one, something like that. So uh, just like a rule for the far field. So these waves normally they're not considerably um, large considered to the distance because when you look at the, our distance was about a meter away, mm -hmm. and the waves probably what I don't know centimeters. Yeah, yeah. So we definitely are in the far field. Mm -hmm. So but there are some rules here. So Fresnel zone, so Fresnel parameters is called. So uh, a squared divided by lambda divided by distance. Mm -hmm. So it should be less than one, much less than one. Yeah, right. If you actually get close to one, that's the most probable. When you get close to one, it can be very messy. Again, you can compensate for this. Actually, the algorithm be much more complicated. The inversion I showed you, so actually the matrix inversion, so become more compli complicated. So you need to do more iterations. So currently, just only one single value decomposition, but then you need to do more iterations. But it's it's part of the research. <laughs> So, Mario, you talked about yourselves. I haven't said that one yet. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention that the temperature, but do you want to measure the temperature and compensate for temperature of the gold sensitivity there? And other on sensitivity, uh, the gold sensitivity is the, I mean, more precise should you be on the, the distance between the, the microphones, uh, between the on the field, and you have some dilatation during the temperature. Temperature is easy because temperature is easy to measure. Actually, sound speed in the air basically changes by 0.6 meters per second per degree. Okay, something like that. It's very easy to fix. And it's not an important parameter because the ch temperature changes much slower than the features you try to measure. So the, going back to the accuracy of locations, we did look at it. So I think it, you can compensate for that as long as you measure for long enough. So variability in the positions does make a difference, but actually it's not the critical, but you got enough microphones. And to be honest, you know, setting up this array precisely is not easy. <laughs> you know, so just uh, how much time you can spend actually sending in water, trying to set it up. So we did set it up to the best of our abilities. With the tape measure, it was okay for the government. So, but, uh, <laughs> but it was probably plus minus, I don't know, some millimeters. And um, we've got 10 minutes left scheduled before lunch. We can extend it to that lunch period a little bit if we want to. But can I suggest that everyone who's presented this morning goes to the front and then we just have, you know, then we can have questions from everybody. It's just easier to remember who's so sure. so the people are to sit in the front. So ask Kieran more questions if you've got more questions. But, you know, let's go to sure. the front. Go on, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you can probably finish recording it.
Well, as a matter of fact, actually, uh, Siemens array is not um, massively high quality. Micro they micro machine microphones. Mm -hmm. So, micro machine microphones, they're amazingly consistent in the phase response. The biggest problem with the micro machine microphones, which cost anything between a pound and five pounds, for instance, quality, is actually a dynamic band. They're only 60 decibel between the lowest sound you can receive and higher sound, which is a thousand times. So compared to high quality microphones, which is about 120 decibel. So actually, um, the problem with this array so is make sure that you are, we always operate in the dynamic band, which is uh, the right one for good signal to noise ratio. So, but the quality of this microphone is pretty much amazing. You can try it yourself. So you can just buy them, which is all, but yeah. I mean, they're very consistent in manufacturing because the way they manufacture yeah. is amazingly consistent. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, so, a sort of real world question, really. Yeah. So, just imagine in one of these gantries or array, one of my patient stations. Um, has any consideration been sort of made with um, biodiversity or animals, with frequencies, bats, <laughs> fish, eels? <laughs> 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 Yeah. That's the first question I'd be asking about this as well. How do we answer this? <laughs> 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 so, in terms of what's under the surface, anything that's going to be on water itself. But above so water, it's all the same. That's going to be much higher than the other. Yeah. How loud is the sound? We hear it. It's. I can't hear until 15 kilohertz. I'm, I'm, old, I'm old enough not to hear. Thank goodness. It's all scared teenagers. There is no doubt. So they just wouldn't stay anywhere close. Now I'll tell you when we did measure, we did measurements in the Ilkley as well, really hot day. We were surrounded by teenagers, beers and barbecues and goodness knows what. Nobody came very close to us. <laughs> so well, and uh, animals that but but in principle what you might want to study we should study to use background noise or can generate noise which is a pseudo random sequence play the level which is hardly perceivable, but we would know what noise you played and then we just make a vision. So that's feasible. We use the convolution. It's more complicated analysis, requires more research. We haven't done it, but it's something you can consider Do it. Second level is not high. Yeah. It's, it's not definite. Similar level, some, some just Right, since we've got everybody down from there, and they almost <laughs> Let's ask some questions to the other guy. I, I've got a question for Nick Huntley. I, I hope it's not an unfair question, but this refers to what you showed us then last week, actually. Uh, it's fine. Yeah, I, I was really intrigued by the way your system seemed to learn and to converge on the correct result. Oh, you mean the good results? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is, is it, can you explain that a little bit? Or is, is oh, that yeah. abstract for, for the audience? That's a very, I'm going to struggle with that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I guess, yeah, that was, um, so for that one, I turned off the model and I also um, had it, so. So, just, so can, should I just get the background? So what it was, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looked to me as though you just turned the system on and it had a sort of vague idea of what was going on. But then it just seemed to itself learn and converge on, on it ultimately a very. Yeah, because I wanted to show how I was building that kind of um, velocity profile. Um, kind of through the observations we were seeing of the surface over that time period. Um, and so uh, you can see um, it started with, because uh, it wasn't filling any of that, that gap information, it didn't have its learning distribution. So it started off very low. And um, as it gained kind of more measurements and added to that distribution, it filled out the, the profile a bit more. 
and then kind of started converging to the discharge estimate. Um, so yeah, it would be good to make an animation of that over time to show you that populated to kind of just show you that more visually. Yeah. Yeah. It's just some of our next uh, uh, measurements last week as well. We did multiple measurements on the River Drew in Admiral last Wednesday, and um, kind of a range between 4.6 and 5.1 QMAX. And next was like five, five liters a second out from the, from the mean between all the different methods, pollution, drone. ABCP radar. Uh, radar was pretty close second as well. Sorry. Maybe you got lucky, but it was impressive. <laughs> oh, it was lucky, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but also there was a different bathymetry. You had your own bathymetry there, right? Yeah, we took our own survey yeah. using our domestic uh, kind of concept yeah. um, and the measuring of this. Yeah, but we brought along uh, Simon's uh, phone in the, the clever part of it now. So yeah. we get to struggle yeah. with technology now. The more careful measurement done. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. We are used to select much base for screen days. And I see now this system more continuous. I mean, we also do this continuous. Um, you own most of it, right? On my way, it's the direction source of the continuous. Um, so, my question is how is this? And like drones, so it's a bed, like it's not like more thinking about not more to continuous kind of measurement from, from very low flows to very high flows. So, why is missing on the gap? Is there a need for low flows? Not is uh, how capable or where is the limit of having high flows? It's a uh, with a good low flows is for free. I don't even know how this comes out. So an overdose is extremely size space or yeah, I think it was really driven um by uh I my PhD is more in kind of numerical water modeling. Um and I just didn't have continuous data where I needed it um to understand what was going on and do better calibration of those models. So yeah, having the continuous um what I was looking for. But I mean, to my point, you know, saying the need for low flow measurements is just as important. Yeah. As my but then my question is like, why is it not more widely used? Oh, why is it still? But why is it not more useful? I think that, I mean, it's one of the issues. Yeah, most of the, I think that low flow is a main issue and it could be more and more important. I mean, we have seen this summer. Uh, we can draw and, and it's very hard to measure low flow, even with conventional method. I mean, you can deploy a DCP, you cannot put your current blitter because there's too few water, or sometimes it's not for some dilution, it's not mixing enough. But then I think it starts to be very tricky also with the method because of the lack of pressure, of course, but also because of very complex, complex hydraulics. And you don't really know how to go from surface density to depth and which must be. The any single small change in the bathymetry, I mean, someone coming up the rack somewhere would change every single bundle for distribution. So, yes, yeah, that would be quite hard. Um, so, I think, I mean, why at EVF we do not use uh, image based for low flows, it's mainly because we don't have enough, we don't we do trust enough the, because of the lack of transfer and the complex algorithms. Yeah, we do not trust, trust enough the measurement. No, I, just a comment in my recent inventions in uh, surface flow symmetry, I, I've been quite surprised in certain parts of the UK anyway, where there can be quite a lot of tracery even in the summer. So, you know, some of the rivers like the Yorkshire Dale, some of the rivers that we had last week or so, even in low flows, if you've got a bit of a riffle, you know, what you end up with quite frequently is very dark water with little bits of foam all over. So, you know, probably half the sites I've looked at in the last week or 10 days. Pretty much all in low flows, but you've still got some tracer and sometimes really quite well distributed. So, so I've always said, Oh, these are methods for high flows, but I'm, I'm encouraged by the practical automation in the last few weeks of through selecting the right side. Mm -hmm. You know, you can actually get quite a good tracer in some of them. But then it would be very sensitive to like wind, for example. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, more, yeah. the faster the velocity of the flow, the less impact of the wind. Yeah. yeah. 
and that, that's where we've tried through like we thought that kind of continuous measurement of the site concept we could like capture different moments in time where you can see like a stray tracer going through and get an observation at that point in cross section at that water level. You know, I think having these very, very powerful. So it's not just 91 time plus having all the data to collect hundreds of measurements of one there. But I think it's great to take sort of hybrid solution. Yeah, so you know, maybe a bit like you've got the radar and, and the camera. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there a lot of that makes well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. But you mean like we find really different solutions that maybe work well at low velocities and low flows and then high flows? Yeah, we still need to make direct measurement because we need to know what's happening in the water. So we still mm -hmm. need to make I mean we need to have a lot of tools to to the situation, but we still need the DCP all the long methods. And, and from your work, I see something we've sort of talked about a few times. Frustratingly, ATP don't give us reading within you know anything from 10 centimeters to half a meter of the surface. And have you seen any more potential for, for filling that gap using some of the surface well symmetry methods? Yeah, I think like we talk about that in some meetings, but just adding some velocity radar on the ADCP could be very helpful because the, I mean you just need to have two radar like the one in the stream flow direction the one in the span direction you can have an idea of the surface of the ski or you know camera um, but then yeah it's still not operational so then we need also the manufacturers to be involved in that to, because when we are on the field I mean we are making a lot of measurement and you don't want each time you go back from the field to to use Five different softwares and to combine the data together to get you to start to learn we need to have also easy solution for, for operational and practical. So maybe we, I think we need to, to, to put the manufacturers more involved in those mix of methods. And maybe the people making ADCP should take a look at what's the radar, what's the images, and try to combine them. That's why drones would be very handy. Yeah, also, yeah. That's what we do with our ARA CPs and our other things. Just before the transect, but it's just said stationary. I mean, you can have the uh, drone hovering above, mm -hmm. um, so you get to be taking the drone by the drone can be scaled on the boat that's yeah. holding the ATP, and you can have the inserts. I think I'm combining a lot of the things that you mentioned for the transmitter waves. With waves, standing waves, this is the sort of sound measurement waves and future long like waves that they are not. It's a good idea in my view. So the fusion of different sensing technologies, for example, technology I was talking about works well for slower flows. And this faster flow, maybe you just say be dominant by the actual flow itself. So the patent waves, but when they actually they flow is not so fast. So then uh, um, it doesn't achieve the uh, maximum the atmospheric theoretical limit for the gravity waves. So then actually, if the, if the pattern is very complex, what you measure is very uncertain for the optical measurements. In my view. Yeah. So then you need to have something like uh, acoustics, and then you just move on to some other means. So, but also another thing as well, because uh, the flow pattern does change. I showed some data, you know, as you move from one way to another, the pattern of way does change quite a bit. Getting actually three D two D pictures, it's important, and only can be achieved by plurality mm -hmm. of sensing methods. Yes. But you, usually, we we need to monitor different cross sections when we are interested in low flow condition or flood condition. We will not we will you will not select the same cross section to perform uh, sensitivity in low flow condition and in high flow condition. You will select a more stable cross section, or you will the, the, the criteria will not be the same. So, so you, probably we will, you you we should have mm, different cross section monitored at the same time. And cross section, that, yeah, that's what that's yeah, my yeah. feeling. But that cross section yeah, is very it's a key point because we think that we have several methods to measure surface velocity quite effectively. 
But then we don't go to measure on bathymetry at the same time. So we rely on previous or after bathymetry, which can be can be a show that it was quite challenging. I was very interested in the presentation of Hamish also with the ground reporting radar because we didn't see a lot of results of this radar. It seems to be very interesting, but doesn't give really we need to do if we want to apply those methods more operationally, we need to be able to measure also the bathymetry at the same time than the last USGS paper from panel 15 years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey, yeah, the mm -hmm. first time it was mm -hmm. nearly 20 years ago, I think. Yeah, but it, I mean, we, I tried to conduct that in France with you, and it was very hard to, to with the ground reflecting radar, it was very hard to see. You have a lot of reflection, and you don't know exactly which one is the one from the bed, and you have to pick one and hope it's really good. <laughs> so, uh, I, mean, I mean, these things have also maybe now, you know, they have, I know that Daniel also is working on the project using ground reflecting radar, so I hope we have soon next visit. And also, some time ago, Giulio Belchetti won a call this, this paper, published a paper showing that the pattern of waves also depends on the bathymetry. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, understanding better pattern of wave, how the changes to the complex bathymetry may be a useful piece of information to understand without measuring actually physically, just looking at the pattern. So, what's, what's the depth below and how does it change? Because you can't solve that dispersion equation or per velocity or anything. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because the depth is in the dispersion relation. Yeah. Yeah. And the same the shear. So actually, you, they, there is a different models for the shear. It's more complicated than shear. But I have to make assumptions. Mm -hmm. Depth, you could probably solve this step between two different velocity and depth from that measure. And the interesting part about depth, which is related to what you said earlier, is that the sensitivity to depth in the dispersion relation is in the 10 centimeters to 15 centimeters. Out larger depths than that, you don't see the sensitivity as much. I've got some graphs here, in that. but in that shallow region, that's really where the sensitivity is configured mm -hmm. above the surface. All right, do we have any more questions? Otherwise, we should probably stop the one. I just I have a specific question for you, Christian. I think so. Because on your presentation, if I remember well, uh, you make the link between the surface density and the uh, cross section velocity. But you derived the cross, you computed the cross section velocity using the LSPIV measurement using this alpha coefficient. Am I right? Yeah. So, what is the sensitivity of the alpha coefficient uh, in that way of computing the cross section velocity? It is something we have to, to do, we still have to do, but uh, we use a 0.85 coefficient and we test between 0.8 and 0.9. But the only thing we could compare with is the station upstream, upstream station, you know, and also some hydraulic modeling, um, to the hydraulic modeling. But I can't, I can't. It, it's not so. It, it it does not change so much the result. But I can't tell you the. I don't remember. And it is a, a big, but it is a, a source of uncertainty. We should perform some uncertainty analysis to different, to different sources. And it is almost impossible to perform alternative discharge measurements in this, in the, well, in this case, because what could be, we, we could use the SVR maybe, mm -hmm. but how do, how do we uh, measure the, the, the cross section? It is, it is like the case in New Zealand or it's very difficult. Yeah, I think that's often the, the challenge is that you come up with the methods, you come up with the discharge figure, and then what do you compare it to? Yes, it's exactly. very very difficult. Simon, did you have something to just about the low flows? I started working in a different world for the so as well as flood risk, I also look at pollution impact and for pollution impact, low flows are everything. High flows don't matter at all. And then they're the ones that will spawn in the in particular looking at uh, impact uh, on uh, surface water bodies at low flows that are really interesting. So, if you've got a method that what does what measures both, it can be of both the products and the it, it, it depends very much on the context because, in my case, for example, in Mediterranean um, context, um, flows and transport is concentrated. Uh, within the, the floods in, in a few hours, 
uh, everything passes uh, through the, the section. So that's why we are very uh, focused on the on the floods. Inter right. But if you uh, shift to uh, more temperate uh, conditions, low flow will have more importance. It depends. I think it depends on if you're looking at runoff or urban systems in fact, you know, rivers, you typically tend to find there will be a time shift between the peak flow rate and the, the pollution that went over the river. And it's that time shift that's important. And as a pillar of all this, it's usually three different places. You make uh, low flow measurements in one place, and medium in another place, and the high measurements in another place. So it's very hard to find a site that suits every flow. So maybe a few of them we have uh, on the exactly same spot, like uh, like you showed with the radar pointing down at rocks. It's a uh, it should be at another location when there's a low flow. So it's, it's hard to combine the methods. They usually wander around different places. So, yeah. Show lunch. It seems like a good idea. Thank you, everybody, for tonight.